Take pay better. Hello, everyone. It's time for us to get started. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackleford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube, where those videos are available to watch anytime afterward. And if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phone. Tomorrow evening at 5.30, the Mississippi College Jazz Band will perform in the Welty Garden. There will be free lemonade and popcorn, and Urban Foxes will be on site selling coffee, pie, and more. Bring a blanket or chair and enjoy the cooler weather with us. And then from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. this Saturday, October 21st, we'll have an archaeology fair outside here on the Entergy Plaza with demonstrations and games for kids, so hope we'll see you for that. And then join us next week for History's Lunch when Christopher Slocum will present A Land of Sickness and Death, Weather, Soil, and Geology at the Civil War Siege of Corinth. I've heard him give this talk before. It's fascinating and really excellent. Today, I am delighted to welcome back Rick Cleveland and Neil White to talk about their new book, The History of Mississippi Football, or, sorry, The Mississippi Football Book. Rick Cleveland is a sports columnist with Mississippi Today. He earned his BS in journalism from the University of Southern Mississippi and has worked for the Monroe, Louisiana News Star World, Jackson Daily News, and Clarion Ledger, and was the sports editor for the Hattiesburg American. Cleveland is the former executive director of the Mississippi Sports Hall of Fame and has been recognized 14 times as Mississippi Sports Writer of the Year. Neil White is the founder of Nautilus Publishing, with whom he has published and edited more than 30 books, a <clears throat> former newspaper editor and advertising executive, White's essays have appeared in the Oxford American, National Geographic, and other magazines. In 2010, he was named Outstanding Author of the Year by the Southeastern Library Association for his memoir, In the Sanctuary of Outcasts, which was chosen as Book of the Year by the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance. Help me welcome Rick Cleveland and Neil White. Um, but I, boy, is that loud. 
I'm going to have to not project here. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, excited to talk to you about this. But before we start telling you the stories in this book, I wanted to give you a little background about how this happened. Okay. Um, so, the Mississippi football book, what was it, Rick, about two years ago? That this two happened? years ago, yeah. Two years ago, there was a study, independent study, about what state was the greatest football state, had the most professional football players from the state, and it's not going to surprise any of you that that was Mississippi. Per capita, Mississippi has more pro football players, more people in the Pro Football Hall of Fame than any other state, and it's not even close. And Rick uh, wrote a column about that. The two of us got together. We had worked together on Mississippi's Greatest Athletes when Rick was at the Sports Hall of Fame, and we wanted to do a project again, and so we sort of proposed this book. Um, Rick has been working on this book for 57 years. Uh, I kicked in in the last six to eight months and uh, did the research on, on the statistics and compiled those, wrote a few stories on the, the history of some of the, the uh, teams that, that Rick didn't have time to write about but already knew about, and uh, published this book. But I, I want to I tell you that I, I think there are there's no other book in the country like this about any state and its football history. And there are two reasons for that. The first is no state has the coverage that Mississippi does from the great high school players, the remarkable junior college uh, history, the colleges, the national championships, and the professional players. And so really no other state could you take all of those and have complete sections in it. But the second reason this is probably the only book of its kind in the U.S. is because of Rick Cleveland. Because there aren't any other states where somebody for 57 years has been reporting on everybody from the high school to the pro level. Uh, Rick has won Sports Writer of the Year, yes, 14 times. The first time was when he was 21 and the last time was last year, and that was a 49-year gap? Yeah. 49-year gap. So he's been doing this at a high level for a long, long time. And Rick asked me to write uh, two features in the professional section. And I said, why? One of them, he wanted me to write for personal reasons. The second reason was Lance Allworth. And I said, why do you want me to write Lance Allworth? And he said, well, I didn't interview him. So he had interviewed everybody else in the professional section in this football, in this football book. So it's a, it's a great, great uh, uh, reference book. It's a great story book. It, even if you don't like football, the behind the scenes stories are remarkable. Most of those I witnessed by Rick. And we're gonna tell you about some of those stories in a minute, but that's how the book came to be. Yeah, you know, Neil, when, when people hear that 49-year gap, they always, a lot of times they'll say, well, your, your daddy would be really proud of you. And I tell them, no, my daddy would say, what happened those other 34 years? <laughs> yeah, which is, which is, if you knew Ace, you'd know that was what he, exactly what he'd say. But uh, from my standpoint, working on this book, uh, and, I'm, and now Neil and I have done two books together, this one and Mississippi's Greatest Athletes, and gosh, if, if every project, if you could work with somebody uh, like Neil, who uh, really, I mean, if you look through the book and look at the organization of it and the layout and the photos and the way that the statistics are placed in there. I mean, there's, uh, it makes it easy as an author or co-author to, to, to do it. I mean, yeah, he, he, he makes a pretty book, and uh, I'm real proud of this one. Me too, and it was a lot of fun. So speaking of fun, I want to I want to prompt Rick. Sometimes I feel like that Saturday Night Live skit where Chris Farley interviews famous people, and he goes, "Hey, you remember when you did that? That was cool. Tell us about that." <laughs> and so that's my role a lot of times. Is hey, Rick, tell them that story, <laughs> and that's how we're going to start today. Rick, would you tell them the story of that great game in 1970 when Southern Mississippi? went to Oxford when Ole Miss was ranked fourth or fifth in the country. Archie was a senior, and the, the line was so 
There was no line. There was no line because there weren't <laughs> enough digits for, uh, for who was going to win. Would you tell them that story? Yeah, well, first of all, one of my favorite parts of the book is that besides remembering the, the greatest players and greatest teams in Mississippi football history, we look back extensively at several of the greatest games in Mississippi football history, and I'm talking about that 1970 Southern Miss Ole Miss game, the 1977 Ole Miss victory over Notre Dame, the 1980 when Mississippi State knocked off Bear Bryant in Alabama six to three, uh, the 1984 Mississippi Valley State Alcorn game, uh, uh, the famous game of the century, as, as the PA announcer called it about 150 times during the game. Uh, but anyway, back to the 1970 game, I, I happened to be a 17-year-old freshman at Southern Miss, where my dad was the sports information director. And so I sat by my daddy in the press box that day at Oxford. And... Uh, uh, I'll tell you how big an upset it was. We flew on a charter plane from Hattiesburg to Oxford. It was a southern, basically it was a southern boosters plane. And there were 55 people on the plane excluding the pilot. And everybody took a dollar bill and wrote the predicted final score of the game on the dollar bill and then put it in a hat. And the one closest to the final score was going to get the $55. Well, these are 55 Southern Miss people, well, 54 and one sports writer who was a student at Southern Miss. And of the 55, 53 picked Ole Miss to win. And the other two, the, the one, there were two others. One was Dipsy Dews, a, a Hattiesburg fixture forever, big Southern fan who had played there, and my dad. And my dad picked the final score, actually picked it to be 28 to 14 with Southern winning, and the final score was 30 to 14 with Southern winning. That's how big an upset it was. The Meridian Star ran a front page of the paper photo that day that it was taken earlier the week of Archie Manning in the locker room pulling up his socks. And the cut line underneath it said, Archie, comma, is this one even worth dressing out for? <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, it's still, uh, what is this? This is uh, 53 years later. It's still the biggest upset I've ever seen in sports. So anyway, get to the end of the game, and I'm going down to the field to get quotes after the game. And I'm coming down from the press box at what was then Hemingway Stadium is now Vault Hemingway Stadium. Going through the stands, get down to the field, find Coach Vault and stand behind him, and then I'm going to follow him out to midfield where he'll meet with the Southern coach, P.W. Underwood, after the game. So I do that and follow him, and I'm – in my line of sight, I can see P.W. Underwood on the other side of the field, you know, walking out to meet Vault. And then all of a sudden, two players get underneath Underwood, who was like, I don't know, 5'11 and weighed maybe 360 pounds. <laughs> and uh, they called him Bear for good reason. And so the Southern players, they've just – pulled off the biggest upset in college football. Uh, and that was a yeoman's task. But a bigger task was to get P.W. on their shoulders and get him out to midfield. And so I'm watching this, and, and they're, they're like teetering on the brink, <laughs> trying, trying to get him up there and get him out to midfield. And they're kind of like going from side to side and everything. And they finally... We get out to midfield, and they finally just collapsed. <laughs> they couldn't hold him anymore, and they just dropped him right at Johnny Vault's feet. <laughs> and Vault, to his everlasting credit, said, 
Well, hell, P.W., you couldn't expect two miracles in one day. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was, it, what an un, unbelievable upset it was. And I remember telling my daddy, I think, I think this is the happiest I've ever seen you in my life. And he said, well, you didn't see me the day you were born, but this is close. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you who remember that game, uh, Wee Willie Heidelberg was a running back for Southern, and he ran all over Ole Miss. He was probably one of two black players in the entire stadium. The next year, Ole Miss signed its first two black players, James Reed and, uh, and – uh, Ben Williams. Ben Williams, General Ben Williams. And so it really set the tone – uh, for integration in the Mississippi schools that weren't formally integrated. Yeah, uh, funny story. Everybody thinks, and you put it this way, yeah. that Willie ran all over Ole Miss that day. Willie Heidelberg touched the ball three times in that game. He was five foot four and weighed 143 pounds, which is why he only touched the ball. I mean, they were scared he was going to get killed. I mean, he, you know, even then in 1970, Five foot four and 143 pounds was pretty little for a college football player. Yeah. But he touched the ball three times and he scored twice. <laughs> and on those two plays, they were both, it was the same play. They were both from the 11 yard line going in. They were both 11 yard runs. They were a little reverse play. And Hemp Cook, who was the offensive line coach at Southern Miss at the time, Mississippi Sports Hall of Famer, became a scout for the Saints forever. And um, Hemp told me years and years after, he said, I could not wait to get back to Hattiesburg and watch the film and see how well my guys, his offensive linemen, blocked for Willie on that play. And he said, he said, Ricky, he called me Ricky, he said, Ricky, we didn't block anybody. Willie just dodged them all. <laughs> <laughs> remarkable player. And remarkable well, yeah, and you know, and uh, we, Willie and I remained friends. He coached at Murr forever, and then he coached a little bit at Bellhaven. Uh, such a great guy. I did his eulogy years and years later. Uh, remarkable guy and a real, you know, pioneer in Mississippi football. I mean, you look at what it was like in 1970, and then look out today at the at the at the field and the makeup of the rosters and he was the first he was something else well speaking of coaches uh why don't you tell this crew about jack carlisle's uh first season coaching oh yeah everybody familiar with uh cactus jack carlisle the coached it well you were there half i know at murr when he was when he was the coach there um Jack Carlisle began his coaching career at a little school in North Mississippi called Lula Rich High School. And uh, his first team, they only had 13 players. And they're playing a road game. I can't remember where they're going. But they really didn't have enough players to need a bus, so they just took three automobiles, just three cars. Well, it turns out the car that was carrying the offensive lineman had car trouble on the way over. So they get ready to start the game, and he's only got 10 players. And um, he's got a, you know, the, he tells the referee, we'll just start with 10 because we'll, the others will show up here in a few minutes. Refer referee says, we can't start unless you got 11 players. So he looks around and sees the manager. And the manager's about five foot three and weighs about 110 pounds. And he calls him by name. He says, Thomas, can you play? Can you just go put on a uniform and play? And the manager says, I'll have to ask my mom. <laughs> and Jack says, where is she? And he points over in the stands. And so Jack goes over the stands and she doesn't want to have any of it. She doesn't, she's scared for her son. And finally Jack says, look, 
I'm going to put him 50 yards away from the play. There's no <laughs> possible way he's going to get hurt. Finally, she says, okay then. So sure enough, first play of the game from scrimmage, Thomas is lined up 50 yards away from the play. Big hole breaks open in the line. Big running back heads down the field, and he heads right at Thomas. I mean right at him. Blows him up, runs right. Could have run around him. Thomas didn't want any part of it. <laughs> Could have run around him, but he didn't. He just ran right over him, broke his arm. That Thomas, his last name was Harris. Thomas Harris, who wrote Silence of the Lambs, <laughs> created the character Hannibal Lecter, who always told Jack Carlisle, that's who, you're who he had in mind. <laughs> <laughs> when he created Hannibal Lecter. Jack was, what a character. I mean, after Murr, he moved over to Jackson Prep and took a lot of his good Murrah players with him. And none, none of the other private schools in Mississippi wanted to play prep because they were so good. And he kept looking for a 10th game that first season. He finally found a school in Arkansas that said they would come if he would pay them a fifth, uh, I think it was, a, it was either ten or $15,000 guarantee to come play. And he did. And... Uh, it was a mismatch, and the score was 49 to nothing at halftime. And they go into the locker rooms, come back out. The coach come, opposing coach comes across the field and says, Jack, I got some bad news for you. And Jack said, what's that? And he said, my guys have quit. <laughs> they ain't coming back out. Jack says, well, they have to. All these people paid money to get in the stadium to see a game. We've got to give them a game. And the coach said, Coach, they ain't coming. And so Jack says, Do you mind if I go talk to them? Coach says, Sure, have at them. So he goes in there and talks to the opposing team at halftime and um, uh, appeals to their manhood and their Arkansas State pride. Said, you gonna let a bunch of Mississippi boys make you quit? And finally one of the Arkansas guys said, I'll play. And then, you know, as it happens sometimes, the other said, well, I'll play, and I'll play, and I'll play. And, and Jack, he capped it by saying, if you come out there and play, I'm only gonna play my ninth and 10th graders. And that did it. And they said, okay, we'll play. And they go back out there. And I asked, I asked Jack years and years, well, what was the final score? And he said, 63 to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but he's the only coach I know who gave a pep talk to both teams. <laughs> so I thought since this is uh, a talk at the History Museums um, that we would talk about some great firsts in Mississippi football. Um, and so, Rick, do you want to tell them about the, the first high school football game? Well, it was, yeah. I gotta, I'm going to have to look up what year it was. But it was... Um, 1905, I think. Yeah, 1905, Yazoo City and uh, Winona. And Ole Miss and State had just started playing. You know, they were playing football at the time. And uh, the two principals decided you know, let's, let's, let's try this at high school level, and they, they decide that to play a game. And uh, there's pictures f of the two teams in the book. And I, do we, do we, yeah, there you go. So that's, that's Winona, uh, and the, the, the fellow in the middle, he was a banker's son, so the W was actually sewn onto his jersey. The others were chalked on the others. <laughs> yeah, the banker's son. <laughs> And that, that's the, his name was Trotter. Uh, and of course, Rick, Rick yeah. and Chuck Trotter, he introduced, he interviewed his grandkids. He was the wealthy one on the team, and that's the Yazoo team. Yeah, and they were, um, to tell you what it was like in 1905 in Mississippi, they had, they took a train. The Winona team took a train to Yazoo City. Well, actually, they took three trains. They had to there were two stops and two changes from <laughs> Winona to Yazoo City. And uh, I, one of the 
grandsons of one of the players said his granddaddy told him that uh, told him that they threatened to throw them the Winona team off the train. They they called them the Jesse James gang. <laughs> they were so rowdy. Uh, Yazoo City won the game uh, five to nothing. And you think, well, a field goal and a safety? No, back then a touchdown was five points. Uh, and if you go over to Yazoo City, there, there's, there's a plaque at the site of, of, the, uh, of the game. Uh, and it was, uh, it's where an elementary school is now. It's right in front of the school where that first game was played. And, you know, I, I often think, if those kids from had, if they had any inkling of all that would follow, and that they were the first to ever play a high school game in a state that has produced, you know, the greatest players and teams in in the history of the sport. My guess is they they had no inkling, but uh, what a, what a great what a great story and and, and event. Yeah. So I want to talk to you all about uh, the first black football game that ever took place in Mississippi. This gentleman's name is John R. Pinkett. Uh, he was originally from Virginia, but he was offered a scholarship at Amherst College, and he played halfback at Amherst uh, from 1908 to 1910. He was all New England. He was the only black player on the Amherst squad, but he got a great education there, and he was hired in 1911 as a linguistics professor, a language professor at Jackson College. And when he got there, he realized that Jackson College didn't have a football team. So this young man from Amherst decided to organize a team. And on November 11th, 1911, Jackson College played Straight University, a college, uh, a seminary college from New Orleans, for the very first time on the fairgrounds uh, in, in Mississippi. There is a photograph of the first team, and you can see that John Pinkett on the far end is still wearing his Amherst jersey while coaching Jackson College. But the newspaper reports, the, the game was a 0-0 tie at the, end of, at the end of the game, but the newspaper reports were talking about how well coached the Jackson College teams were. And it was such a popular event that two years later in 1913, uh, Jackson College started playing exhibition games during the state fair and over 2,000 people would go and watch those games. But what I think is so fascinating about it is a young man from Amherst College, and my son actually teaches there, their stadium might hold 2,000 people. A kid from Amherst College is responsible for what is probably the greatest HBCU program in the country uh, moving here from uh, Massachusetts. So. Uh, Really, really cool stuff. Uh, anybody know who this guy is? He was forgotten by most of the world. Everybody thinks that Bruiser Kennard was the first all-American uh, college football player from Mississippi. But six years before, actually seven years before Bruiser was uh, named all-American, this young man from Bay St. Louis, his name was Marchmond Schwartz. They called him Marchie Schwartz. Grew up in Bay St. Louis and played at St. Stanislaus. He lettered in eight sports at St. Stanislaus, and in 1929, he signed on to play for Notre Dame and Newt Rockney. And in 29 and 30, he was a consensus All-American. We discovered this by going back to the newspaper reports. So this forgotten kid from Bay St. Louis, Marchie Schwartz, was the first All-American from Mississippi a full seven years before the now famous Bruiser Kennard was. So we're, we're happy to introduce Marchie back to, uh, to the folks in Mississippi. Um, and then the other thing that I thought would, would interest y'all is, you know, college football was so popular in the, in, the, in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Pro football didn't catch on really until, I guess, Charlie Connolly and that great game um, with the, the Giants and the Colts. But the early, early pro football teams had some great Mississippi players. This young man's name is Gil Reese, and he's from Tupelo. They called him the Tupelo Flash, and he ran a 10-flat 100, which was one unheard of at the time, and he went to Vanderbilt. 
He was an All-Southern Conference all four years. His senior year, he was captain of the baseball, basketball, and football teams. And in 1929, he was playing for a professional team out of Memphis that Clarence Saunders, who founded Piggly Wiggly, had started. And back then, it was kind of the Wild West in pro football. They weren't members of the NFL. They were just an independent team. And they were called the Memphis Brys Hurricanes. The next year, they changed their name to the Memphis Tigers, which was a lot easier on, on the ears and newspaper reporters. But Gil Reese, along with Austin Applewhite and a guy named Cowboy Lee Woodruff from Ole Miss, played on this Memphis Tigers team. And in 1930, they beat the world champion Green Bay Packers in, a, in an exhibition game. They were that good. They also took it on a challenge that Rick can tell you about later from uh, Goat Hale and lost to the Mississippi All-Stars. But here's what's most fascinating about it. Clarence Saunders in 1930 was offered an, an NFL franchise uh, and he turned it down. He said he was going to build a 65,000 seat stadium in Memphis and have all home games and keep all the revenue for himself. And that's why Memphis does not have an NFL team that uh, they passed on. But interestingly, none of those people qualified as the first NFL players from Mississippi because none of those teams were actually members. But this gentleman, Cowboy Lee Woodruff, in 1931 left the Memphis Tigers and he played for the Providence Steamrollers. The next year he went to the, uh, the Cardinals, uh, a team that we all still know about. But for the first couple of years of the NFL, the Providence Steamrollers did have an NFL team. So Lee Woodruff, Cowboy Lee Woodruff, whose son played for Ole Miss, he was from Batesville. He is the first NFL player from Mississippi. So just kind of some FYI. How much were optional? Excuse me? How much were optional? They certainly were optional, yeah. Um, it, I think they were optional until the, the, the late 30s. And early on, if you look at those, those early teams, they grew their hair real long as protection. I mean, that's, that's how they did it. Yeah. Not a hell of a lot of protection. No. Uh, you know, you're talking about Vanderbilt, and, uh, and they were the great power, football power, in the South back in those days. But what a lot of Mississippians don't know is that back in those days in the um, – early 20th century, the real football powers in Mississippi were Mississippi College and Millsaps. Um, I'm going to read just from here. Uh, on, on November 13, 1915, Ole Miss ran into a one-man wrecking crew with the nickname of GOAT. Goat's full name was Edwin Whitfield Hale, and he was quite possibly the best football player most folks never heard of. On that autumn afternoon so long ago at the state fairgrounds, Hale ran for six touchdowns to lead Mississippi College to a 74-6 victory over Ole Miss. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Later opened up the sporting good. Hale and Jones. Jones, which uh, my dad at Gulf Coast Perkins used to buy all of their athletic supplies from Goat, and Goat used to come and hang out at our house and stay with us. But he worked the state, you know, in, in the sporting goods business after that. Oh, yeah. He, they, that's where everybody in Mississippi got their equipment was held. I mean, every, not just colleges, every high school, junior college, everybody got their stuff from Hale and Jones. Uh, the, the most interesting thing about Goat to me is that he was an All-American for two years at MC, and then he volunteered to fight in World War I. And he's fighting in the uh, French forest, fighting the Germans in a French forest, and got shot in the leg and uh, went missing for six months and presumed dead. And then he was, they found him in a remote uh, French hospital. Um, he was shipped back to the United States. He recovered and 
returned to Mississippi College where he was an All-American two more years. And he always said that he wasn't as good after the war as he had been before the war. But that's debatable because his junior year, he led the nation in scoring. He scored 24 touchdowns. And what's more, he kicked the extra point after all 24 <laughs> touchdowns. Goat hell. Uh, and in his 30s, he organized the all-star team that beat the Memphis Tigers that had beaten the, the Green Bay Packers the year before. So that's, that's how many years he played football at, at a remarkably high level. Yeah, uh, the nickname, GOAT. Um, Hale earned that when he played football at Jackson Central High School, apparently in a game against Brookhaven during his senior year of 1914. Hale lowered his head, battered his way through the line, kept going through the end zone, and then ran into a wooden building where he loosened a few planks of lumber. He runs like a goat, someone said, and it stuck. Goat head. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're great stories like that throughout the entire book, and, and most of the narrative was done by Rick. It's fascinating. I, I encourage you to read it, whether you're a football fan or not. I think you'll, you'll find it fascinating and, and funny and, uh, and entertaining. I did want to talk for a minute about some of the records. Um, each section has a, an all-time record section and na annual leaders from each of the years, and it's, it's jam-packed with with Mississippians, as you might imagine. Some of them still hold national records. Um, but one of the things I wanted to point out is, anybody want to guess who had the Mississippian in the pros who had the highest passer rating in a season, the best season ever for a Mississippi quarterback? Well, I would, but... <laughs> well, Brett Favre won the MVP Two times. Eli Manning, I guess. Uh, Brett won three times. Three Brett won three times. That's right. Three times. Um, it's Charlie Connerly. He, in, in 1959, when he was 38 years old, he had a passer rating of 135.1. And that is higher than Brett Favre's all three of his MVP seasons, uh, highest that anybody has ever had from this state. And Charlie Connerly still not in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, which is just heartbreaking. Oh, it's absurd yeah. that he's not in the pro football hall of fame. But usually in these record sections we have passing and we have three or four people who led the league, you know, in their year. We have one or two people like Rod Davis still holds the, the NCAA record from Southern uh, for most uh, most individual tackles, solo tackles. He had 360 in his career. But most people have one name, one record, except Steve McNair, Jerry Rice, and Willie Totten. There are whole sections of their individual records that they still hold in the NCAA. Uh, pretty remarkable players all the way around. Yeah, you know, one thing I wanted to bring up today, especially since we're here in this museum, uh, the Mississippi Football Book includes a, a piece with several photos of a football star at Alcorn uh, from the early 1950s. Uh, his name was Medgar Evers. I bet, I'm not sure everybody knew that. Uh, he, was a, uh, he was a running back. He had already, already served his country in World War II, uh, but he, he and his brother Charles both played on the Alcorn football team that won all but one game. Uh, they had uh, interesting thing about that. They were the two brothers had a car, which was one of only about three student-owned cars on the Alcorn campus back then, and they used it to run a taxi service between the bus station and Alcorn, and to run a cleaning service for uh, cleaning service in Port Gibson. They would run clothes back and forth. Uh, uh, Charles said, you know, his brother, he said, Ed Medgar was a whole lot better football player than I was. He was a whole lot better student, too. He said, Medgar made all A's. <laughs> he said, I made C's. And, 
I said, I, I remember interviewing him, I said, well, why is that, Charles? And he said, I was too busy chasing the women. <laughs> he said, and this was when he was 90 years old, and he said, I'm still chasing them, I just can't catch them anymore. <laughs> That's yeah. great. So anybody have any questions? We have lots of stories we can tell, but okay, good, 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 good. Start here. Oh, microphone, yeah, okay. Right up, right up here. Thanks, Chris. Do you have any stories about Joe Green from Canton, who played with the championship Pittsburgh Steelers? Well, actually, you know, Mean Joe didn't play. He, he's not from Canton. His teammate was L.C. Greenwood. L.C. Greenwood, Hollywood Greenwood. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. But he was a teammate on the Steel Curve. He, that's right. Here's the thing that's so interesting to me about L.C. Greenwood is that he, of all those defensive linemen from all those great Pittsburgh Steelers teams, the guy that had the most sacks was L.C. Greenwood, and he's the only one of the four of the, of the front line, the defensive lineman, who's not in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and he should be. In fact, we have a whole section on, on not only on the Mississippians who are in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, but the ones that we think should be and are not. And and LC's high on that list. He sure is. Y'all want to hear that list of people who should be? This is this is this is subjective, obviously. But Charlie Connerly, Harold Jackson, LC Greenwood, Jimmy Giles, Kent Hull. The next three probably will be, but just haven't. Been. Well, Pat, Steve McNair, Eli Manning, Patrick Willis, and probably a couple others too. Yeah, well, there's some playing right now yeah, for sure that 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 someday will be. But of the ones that are retired, that's a pretty good list. I don't. And and I'll tell you this too. Not only do we have the most per capita, Jackson State has more players in the Pro Football Hall of Fame than the state of New York. <laughs> Tell us about Shorty McWilliams' career at Mississippi <laughs> State, going up to Army, winning the national championship, coming back to Mississippi State. How do, you, how do you serve one year in the Army at the end of World War II and come back home and do all the stuff that he did? <laughs> you going to tell him why he came back? Well, I'll, I'll tell you how he came back. He came back in a Cadillac. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't paid for by Army. <laughs> <laughs> He was uh, Shorty Mac. <clears throat> My dad, of course, was a Southern guy, but he always told me that the best football player he ever saw was Shorty McWilliams. Uh, there's a story in the book about his, his last game at Meridian High was for the Big 8 championship. He carried the ball eight times, and he scored seven touchdowns on the first seven carries. And on the eighth carry, he ran 60 yards down the field and pulled his hamstring on about the 20. <laughs> so he didn't score on that one. But he was, he was unbelievable. Uh, one of my favorite stories about him is in, uh, he was a funny guy. I, my daddy would take me, we, I'd wake up on a Saturday morning in Hattiesburg during the summer and, and my daddy would say, let's go up to Meridian and have lunch with Shorty Mac. And we'd drive up there to Wideman's, and I'd sit there and eat peanut butter and crackers and while my daddy talked to Shorty Mac about football. That's about as good as it gets for a kid. <laughs> it, was, it was terrific. But when Shorty Mac was at State, he was in the showers one day, and a couple of his teammates had been hunting, and they had caught, they had caught a live raccoon. And so they... While Shorty was in the shower, they went out and got the bag that had the ca raccoon and let him loose in the shower. <laughs> and they said, of all the runs they ever said, saw Shorty Mac make, that was the fastest he ever ran. <laughs> and he ran out of the shower through the office, the football office with the secretary and everything, and out into the outside and without a stitch of clothing on. <laughs> 
Tell them about the uh, LSU uh, Baton Rouge game. Oh, there's a there's a film, and have, you know about this, and and, and Hilda. The, there's a film that you can watch at the at the sports museum, the Sports Hall of Fame, of Shorty Mack talking about his first game at Tiger Stadium, and he says he was practicing punts at the end of the end zone, kicking back into the field before the game, and he said, unbeknownst to me. They roll that cage with that tiger behind me. And unbeknownst to me, that cage had a microphone in it. And he said, when that tiger roared, I soiled myself. <laughs> <laughs> I had to play that whole game in soil britches. <laughs> you know, the great thing about Shorty Mac, I mean, there's a picture of him with that backfield in Army. Uh, and, you know, Doc Blanchard and Glenn Davis won the Heisman. He came back to state, did great his senior year, but had he stayed, he probably would have won the Heisman Trophy that year. He would have won it at, at Army. Uh, I just finished a book about the uh, – it's called uh, Mr. Inside and Mr. Outside about Blanchard and Davis, and there's a lot in it about Shorty Mac. When he was a plebe at Army, he won the heavyweight championship of the U.S. Military Academy, boxing. And he had never boxed much. You know, he, he I, I don't guess boxing was real big in Meridian, but anyway, he goes to Army and wins the heavyweight championship as a plebe. <laughs> I don't, probably that's never happened. We had a question back here too. You go ahead and then we have one back there. You all are probably not old enough to have covered the 62-63 Jackson State football team? Not me. Okay. Well, I was just curious, and maybe in your next book you can include this part. For one thing, John Merritt, who was their coach, has been nationally voted as one of the top 100 coaches of all times, period. <coughs> Secondly, from that team, 14 players eventually made it into the NFL. Amazing. And one of the greatest upsets at that time was when Jackson State, who had never been heard of, beat FAMU in Florida for the Orange Blossom Classic. Oh, that's great. Well, John Merritt is featured in the book, and he, he's there. Uh, that's, that's remarkable. Big John Merritt, yeah. And, and uh, the, the, probably the best player on that team was Willie Richardson. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And he's featured in here as well. So. Yeah. But thank you for that. Thank you for that. Go ahead. Jeff Young, please. It, also, it might also be important to point out that three of the Richardson brothers eventually played in the NFL, William Gloucester and Thomas. Yep. Rick's included that. Thank yeah. you. That's, that's great information. Appreciate it. Thank you for that information. Um, forgive my ignorance. I don't really like I don't really like football. <laughs> Thanks for um, coming anyway. <laughs> um, um, is it true um, the James Meredith entered, I think, um, Ole Miss in, I think, 1962 to 63, around that time? Were there any, uh, were there, um, any football, black football players who played for Ole Miss before Meredith actually entered Ole Miss? Or was Meredith the first? I know he was the first black man to enter Ole Miss. Were there any black football players before Meredith who played for, played for Ole Miss? And secondly, um, how did segregation impact um, black football players? If and then if it did in any way, segregation and racism, did that impact the lives of any football players in any way? Rick, I'll let you answer the second piece, but Ole Miss didn't have a black player until uh, James Reed and Ben Williams, and, and they, they started in 1971. Those are the first two black players at Ole Miss. Well, the, the best way to answer the second part of your problem, can you imagine if the best players that played for Johnny Vaught at Ole Miss had been combined with the best players that played for John Merritt at Jackson State or Marino Chasm at Alcorn, if you had combined 
all those great Mississippi players into a team in the 50s and 60s, they, they would have won national championship after national championship after national championship. It was just, it would have, it wouldn't have been fair. It would not have been fair. There's a list in the back of all the national championships that Mississippian, Mississippi can claim from high school through college, and there are 33 national championships from Mississippi. And in those years, thank you for your question, sir, Ole Miss in 1960, Ole Miss in 1961, Southern Miss, Mississippi Southern in 1962, and Jackson State in 1962 all shared a claim in those three years to a national title. Imagine if that had happened. And Rick has a great story. I'll tell you, you know, segregation changed football, which changed our state, which changed the world, and it's a wonderful thing, but there was still a stigma associated with it, and one of the best stories to illustrate that is Walter Payton's senior year in high school and what happened and who recruited him and why. Yeah, Walter... As Walter was a year younger than I, and I was working, I started working for the Hattiesburg American when I was 13. And Columbia was uh, 27 miles away from Hattiesburg and was on the very fringe of our circulation area at the Hattiesburg American. So we didn't really send riders that much over to Columbia, but we had a correspondent there who would call in the games to us. And she was an old white lady named Eva B. Beats. I'll never forget her. She, she would call every Friday night with the results from Columbia. And she always asked for me. She wanted to talk to me on the phone for some reason. Again, she called me Ricky. I went by Ricky when I was little. And uh, she'd always started out, she'd say, Ricky, you ain't going to believe what that Peyton boy did tonight. <laughs> And, uh, and I remember the last Friday night of his senior season, she said, well, he outdid himself tonight. And I said, what'd he do, Miss Beats? And she said, he scored six touchdowns, and on the sixth one, he turned around and ran the last 30 yards backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Found out later, that's why Ole Miss State and Southern Miss didn't recruit Walter. They thought he was a show out. And at the cusp of integration, they didn't want anybody that turned around and ran the backwards for touchdowns. Well, well Rick's position is he's got a great statement about that. Yeah, I mean, you can teach a guy to hand the ball to the referee. You can't teach him to score seven <laughs> touchdowns in a game, you know, or six or whatever it was. I'll tell you about one of my favorite Walter stories. When he's a senior at Jackson State, he had already hired an agent, uh, Bud Holmes, who was a lawyer in Hattiesburg. And Bud was a friend of my family, and I remember he called me one morning at the paper that uh, spring after Walter's senior season and says, hey, Ricky, you want to ride to Jackson with me? And they're having senior day at Ole Miss. I mean, at Jackson State. They're having senior day. And senior day is when all the NFL teams send scouts and coaches to a university to uh, to time the players in the 40-yard dash, see how many times they can bench press a certain amount of weight, interview them and all that. And I said, sure, bud, I'd love to go. And so we, we uh, ride up to Jackson and uh, we get there and they're lined up to run the 40-yard dash. That's the first thing they're going to do. And uh, to tell you how good Jackson State was, they had 21 seniors that the NFL coaches and scouts wanted to time. 21. <laughs> Two of them would go in the first six picks of the draft. Um, anyway, so Walter's first, and he knocks off about three, four, 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 four five, 40 yard dashes, which is flying if you weigh 215 pounds. And, uh, so he, he runs those 40-yard dashes, and he goes and sits on his helmet and waits for everybody else to run their 40-yard dash. When everybody's through, Walter, y'all may remember, Walter had a real high-pitched voice. He sounded, you know, almost like a woman. when he, And he said, he, he got up and he said, Hey, y'all, time this. 
He goes back to the starting line, gets down on his hands and knees, then gets into a handstand. And he handstands 40 yards. <laughs> Think about that. Everybody, usually when I tell this story, they, people say, well, what was his time? <laughs> well, the answer is I don't know, but it was a world record. Because <laughs> nobody else could do it. He had his shirt off, by the way. That, by that time, he had his shirt off. And him handstanding with the sweat glistening, it was unbelievable. I mean, there are there are muscles places people don't have muscles. <laughs> no doubt, gentlemen. I can't wait to read the book. Uh, you touched on this earlier about uh, those deserving to be in the Hall of Fame, and I had four names. One of which you mentioned, uh, Kent Hall, but the other three were Jimmy Smith, uh, Leon Gray, and Earl Leggett. Can you give me your opinion on them? Well, I think Jimmy Smith. If you look at the numbers, he definitely. To, deserves to be in there. Earl Leggett, who played at Hines and then played at LSU, uh, if they put assistant coaches into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, he probably might be the first assistant coach to go in there because he was such a um, – he became legendary for his development of defensive linemen in the NFL. Uh, in fact, uh, Howie, Howie Long, when he was voted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, he had Earl Leggett be his presenter. Um, so he, he it, they really don't put assistant coaches in the Hall of Fame. If they did, he'd be the first one. Who was the other gentleman? Leon Gray. Oh, Leon Gray. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah they're, they're all listed in the back of the book as, as, as pros who, who – merited coverage in this book so they're all in it um yeah yeah yes sir uh behind no uh ray guy <laughs> made the sports pro football hall of fame just kick it all he ever did was punt kick it we had a young man who graduated from brinkley high school went to tennessee state university made all american played football for the Kansas City Chief. The name was Nola Susanat Smith. Do you think that his name should have been added to that list since uh, Ray Guy, all he did was punt. And right now, Nolan Smith still has a record of football return in the National Football Hall of Fame. Super Nat, Nolan Smith, he's uh, one of my favorite guys besides being a great player. Uh, yeah, I, th I think you may be shortchanging Ray just a little bit. Uh, he's, he's, he's the greatest kicker that ever lived, but he, he was way, mo way more than that. He was, uh, he's the best athlete I ever saw. Uh, as far as everything, hand-eye coordination, kicking the ball, running the ball, throwing a ball. Uh, he was... Uh, He's still uh, second all-time at Southern in interceptions. Yeah, he, he, I, I remember going down to the field for interviews like the earlier story one time at the end of a Memphis State Southern game and uh, Memphis receiver right in front of me comes over the middle to catch a pass and Ray hit him in the chest with his helmet first in the chest, and the guy went out, just crumpled onto the ground, and um, I, should, I thought he might be dead. That's how hard he hit him. And then after they finally revived the guy, they start looking around in the grass, and I think they're looking for contacts or something. No, they were looking for his teeth. <laughs> he hit him so hard his front teeth came out. Um, yeah, Ray, w Ray was an unbelievable athlete. Supernat was great. I loved him. Another great kick returner that, uh, from Mississippi that played in the NFL is Walter's brother. Uh, Eddie Payton was a terrific kick returner. One of the, one of the things on Ray Guy, Rick, Rick can talk about him forever, but uh, I don't know if it lasted his last couple of years, but almost his entire NFL career, he didn't have a punt return for a touchdown. 
or have one blocked. Yeah. And the reason was he had played safety at Southern, remarkable athlete, and he was the safety on punts. If anybody broke through, he was there to tackle. Yeah, he was. He was. Uh, but my favorite story when he went in the Pro Football Hall of Fame finally. And I actually lobbied for him for years and years to go in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And he finally gets selected, and I say, well, now what am I going to write about him? I've written everything in the world. So I call his high school coach, and I t said, tell me something about Ray Guy. I don't know. And he said, well, he said, you know, Ray never could run track for us because he was a baseball pitcher in the season's uh, overlap so we never could use him to have to, for our track team and he said but his his senior year the baseball season finished before the state track meet so we get ready to go to Atlanta for the state track meet he was from Thompson Georgia and they get ready to go to Atlanta for the state track meet and uh, they've got a great team but they don't have anybody who can jump. They're not very good in the field events. And football coach says, well, you know, if you take Ray, he, he'll win the long jump and the high jump. I guarantee you, he'll win it. And then they got on the bus going over to Atlanta, and they said, I wonder how he'd do in the triple jump. And so they cleared the aisles of the bus, <laughs> and they teach him the steps of the triple jump on the way to the state track meet. And so... They get to the track meet. He wins the long jump, the high jump, and the triple jump. <laughs> and Thompson wins the state championship in track. There was nothing he couldn't do. Rick, uh, I think the greatest, most electric game in Mississippi has to be the Alcorn Valley game. And, uh, but there's a statistic about that game that's reported wrong. Uh, I have a great friend who's an All-American football player at Mississippi State, and we've talked about that for years, and the fact that there were 60,000 people there without a seat, every aisle seat, and he said, that is wrong. There were 500,000 people there. <laughs> and I said, you know, that's, I know, it's a nice joke. He said, no, throughout my life I've talked to uh, white boys in Mississippi, and every single one of them claims they were at that game. <laughs> so I told him, well, here's the test. Uh, when you're talking to them, they claim to have been there, and I was there by myself. Uh, ask them what the uh, announcer said every two minutes, and you'll remember this. There's a marker on the field. There's a marker <laughs> on the field, yeah. It was, it was unbelievable. You know, it's it's. I guess it's in the book, right? That that um, that game was supposed to be played in Itabina. Right, it is. And about six, about a month before the game, both Alcorn and Valley were undefeated, and both were breaking records. And uh, and I wrote a column in the uh, in the Jackson Daily News uh, before I killed it off, <laughs> uh, and. Uh, I, I said, we need to go ahead and move that game and play it in Jackson because it'll, it'll draw more folks than anybody ever. And uh, the problem was there was a doubleheader scheduled, an SEC doubleheader that Saturday uh, that, it, that the Valley Alcorn game was already scheduled. So I went and saw Barney Poole, who was the stadium manager at, at, at Mississippi Memorial Stadium, and I... I said, Barney, is there any rule against playing on Sunday? He said, well, you know, that's my only day off. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but let's look at the big picture here. <laughs> and uh, so eventually, then, of course, we had to talk. After he agreed to it, I had to get Alcorn and Valley to sign off on it. Well, Marino Chasm at Alcorn, that was the easiest <laughs> That was the easiest talk I ever had. I said, Coach, you would, would you want to move that game to Jackson from Itapena? Yes. <laughs> yes. And uh, then Archie was a different – Archie Cooley, who was the coach at Valley, when I called him, he said, I don't know about that now. we got to – you know, we've been moving from our home field and all that. And I said, yeah, but think about this, Coach. How many – 
there'll be 60,000 people. That'll be the biggest payday in Mississippi Valley State history. So eventually he came around and we played the game there and it's still one, uh, it's still one of the greatest days I've ever had in Mississippi was watching that game. And to look, to be in the press box and look out in that crowd and see that many white faces at a SWAT game I'd never seen that before. I'm not sure I've ever seen it since. And didn't Michael Rubenstein get all the local channels to bump the pro games to broadcast uh, this game? Well, what happened is he syndicated the Mike Michael syndicated the game around the state. He did the play-by-play, uh, -by -play, and W. C. Gordon, who was the Jackson State coach, did the color. That's great. And um, in the in the TV ratings that came out about a week later, the Alcorn Valley game in Mississippi out, rate, the ratings for the Alcorn Valley were higher than any of the NFL games, including the Saints, which is saying something in Mississippi. Yeah. yeah. So the bad news is we have run out of time for questions before we were able to get to all the questions. The good news is Neil and Rick are going to hang out for a while. <laughs> And you can ask them whatever question you want. They'll be selling and signing books right over here. Thank you all for coming today. Remember, there's the uh, Jazz Golly, and Garden fast. on Thursday. There's the Archaeology Fair here this weekend. And then please come back next week for Chris Locum's History's Lunch. For now, help me thank Rick Cleveland and Neil White for this fantastic program. Today. Thank you all. Yes, ma'am. But you all made this. Thing.